shit. Huh. It's a unique hustle, nigga. Big shit. Big shit. Big shit. Big shit. Huh. Name another podcast. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique house. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely official, Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Nothing, nothing, my dad. Well, man, gone. hey, man, another another great uh, segment, man. We about to get into it, man. I'm loving this, man. Say we got a guest here today, man. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, you know I got to get over there and get me something to eat. You know, everybody yes, been telling me about it. They calling me about it, man. <laughs> it, it, it's really it's something else, man. Mr. Ricky Booker is in here, man, from the Breakfast Brothers. Breakfast Brothers, thanks man, for having me. The Appreciate Breakfast it. Brothers, yes, man. Sir. So, mm-hmm. so I, I, when we looked it up, we were looking for the other brother. I know that. I <laughs> could not find the other brother. We, we I think I've seen him. He's around. And, and it's gonna be a real big secret. I'm gonna bring him out one day. It's gonna be on the episode. Are you which, serious? Oh yeah, it's gonna be. be on what episode? So you don't have a picture of him well, anywhere we'll be on on this episode. Media. This episode, but I'm gonna have y'all on this on the episode that I'm gonna have. Oh, you got a podcast too. coming? No, TV show. TV show. TV show. That's Cooking the show. way things go. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Cooking show. Wh- whoever did y'all intro, I need one of them. That I got soon it. As okay. I come on, I like almost. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> you, usually they use whack artists yeah. and do a whack jingle. Yeah, that's, no, that's no, I got no, some funny. I got some heat. I got some yeah. heat. She, yeah, she go hard. Yeah, yeah. and I make yeah. sure we like, hey, do it. Hey, make sure, yeah, because we want to make sure. <laughs> name another podcast like this. Mm-hmm. That's XO no, man. That was real. That intro Thank was you, real. Man. Good. Yeah, she yeah. love that too. XO man, what's up, girl? You know, and and you, 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 you start this Breakfast Brothers. How does how does? And first of all, Ricky Booker, where is he from? You know, what, who is he? I'm originally from Oklahoma City. Really? Up and the street. That's why mm-hmm. him and Up BC so cool. That's my brother <laughs> from another mother. <laughs> Y'all Oklahoma boys, yeah. <laughs> They got that weed up there. <laughs> you, know, you know, that's how you reservation land and weed, man. We, we do now. <laughs> I know it. But you know, they got weed everywhere now. Oh, yeah. Well, we they just, got it everywhere. But that's not legal in Texas yet. It's been everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's not there yet. Yeah, okay. We yeah, yeah, yeah. We ain't snitching, uh, though. Yeah. We live by code. You know? But you know you can go to Windstar Casino. You can exit, turn left. Go to the dispensary, jump right back on that on ramp, coming back to Texas. Oh, for real? Ramp. That's dope. That quit. Wow. Yeah, till somebody stop you and catch you. <laughs> all that stuff, then it's a problem. They cookies up there strong, <laughs> right? They got Man, cookies up there. Uh, I, I got to tell you a quick story about edible. We're going to get back to it. Okay. Uh, my girlfriend, during pandemic, she was making edibles. And she's doing good. She started doing Instacart. And I found out what Instacart and all of that was during pandemic. Time. Okay. And she said, uh, make some Rice Krispie edit. I said, those things look good. She said, they are. And I said, I don't want an edible, eat? though. Oh, okay. She said, I'm going to make you separate. i make you one or two by yourself. I said, okay, cool. One evening she left and I went in there. I seen two sitting there, so I'm assuming them two. <laughs> she had packaged up all of them and left two there because she was in a hurry to leave. Okay. She never baked my two. So I ate one. I was standing in the kitchen and I ate one. I said, ooh, this thing is good. It's, yeah. I mean, it was real good. And I said, kind of tastes like weed. <laughs> but it was so addicting. I ended up, you know, it's about that thick and about that, about that wide probably. Okay, I ended up but, eating the whole edible. But that's the thing. You because, ate the whole okay, thing. The thing that I've always heard from people who do eat edibles, especially the cookies and mm-hmm. all of that, they said when you're eating that, you can't just eat a whole cookie. You better just take a little piece off and you eat that because if you do, you're going to get so messed up. I was told up. I got to the, the to the bedroom and I had a TV on. I was sitting there finished eating and I was sitting on the edge of the bed and I just started leaning back and I fell back on the bed. The TV seemed like it was in front, right here in front of me. And I could see my cell phone and I just could look at it, but I couldn't reach for it. And I could feel my heartbeat. I was like, it's like it's I was racing. getting anxiety. I was like, right. couldn't breathe and I was stuck. Paranoid. And man, Pop, I guess about, this was like six in the evening, about 10 o'clock she finally came home. I'm still laying in that position, bug at it, looking over to my phone. She came in and was like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, I ate your edible. <laughs> and I was so high, it was. I thought I was going to OD, and I ain't touched the edible. I don't even mess with no. it. It's a good thing you only had one. But it was a whole thick one. Thick one. Wow. <laughs> but he was kicking it, too. Best yeah. Rice Krispie treat I ever ate, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's dope, though. Oh, that's that's real right. dope. Yeah, real I dope. That's real. <laughs> <laughs> it's dope, but real dope. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so what where when you was in Oklahoma did you cook or is this something you just started doing in here? Well, when we when I was young, all my mom's sisters, my grandmother and my mother all cooked. Okay. I used to hang out in the kitchen with them. So you know, back in those days, when it's time to go to school, 
it was just me and my sister. So your parents was either at work or they was gone already that morning. So you had to fend for yourself. So mm -hmm. nine, ten years old, I would get up and make my me and my sister a piece of toast and, and some bacon and I would fix us breakfast and we would leave. But were so, you doing like fancy breakfast or was you just doing just, just something th together? No, just I was actually doing where, where now they call, you know, breakfast sandwiches where I would fry egg and have bacon and, and toast with. And back then they had to pop up toast and put it together. And we made a sandwich and I couldn't have and we shared it. Right. As we was walking on the bus, we had with the cheese, fried egg and, and bacon sandwich. At the time, I didn't. I just knew how to do it. And it was just always in me. And, and how taste old were you at this time? I was nine. Mm, you were young. Young. I it. wish I could get my son in yeah. the kitchen cooking. But I it, wish you can get um, get him in the room cleaning up. <laughs> wish you can get him outside in the yard and a little more. And yeah, it's a lot of things we wish. We wish. Yeah, well, but we didn't have video games and iPhones we back then. No, so. we didn't. No. We Tell didn't me have, about yeah. it. Yeah. So that's that stopping him from that well, cleaning up the room. Well, did your siblings cook too? No, my sister. Well, as she got older, she did. Okay. She got older. What's your uh, What's your what, what do you think you bad at? Like I can cook that. That's what I do. That's my famous such and such. I I used to do a mean pot roast. A mean pot yeah. roast. Yeah. What's your secret recipe? Uh, the 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 secret to a pot roast. You know, like sometimes people even with steak, people think the redder the steak is, the better and fresher it is. The redder the steak is, the more blood is in it. They have actual steakhouses, and especially in, in New York area, where they have like the winery room where they dry out the wine. Mm -hmm. They have they hang up steak and dry out the steak before they mm. cook it. The best steak ever you can eat that way. Because that's the thing, okay. I like that, I like that. No, I, I you heard do, what I'm he said. Hold on, because yeah, I'm going to get to that. That's my guy right there. No, because mm -hmm. I'm going to get to that, because out. the thing mm -hmm. is that. I'm sick of these red meat, okay. don't yeah. give it to me. Because <laughs> we've always, like in the past, we've always said, okay, we want our steak well done. And that's when we I'll went. Say. When we went anywhere, they look at us crazy because it's like, oh, that's dry and it's not gonna have, it's not gonna be moist, it's not gonna be this mm -hmm. and that. So now it's a case where, okay, we like it medium well. So it needs to be well, but a little tiny pink where you really don't really see that much pink, mm -hmm. but it's a little mm -hmm. bit. And it gets a little bit more moist, but I see people eat, eat it like with a red, we cut it, you see that blood. I'm like, that can't be good for you. The, the, it's not good for you. The thing is about it, and what I was going to tell you about the pot roast, what make the pot roast the, the most the most tasteful and juiceful and all the ingredients in the world is people, We when we grew up, we wanted, we black families froze everything. Put it in mm -hmm. the deep freezer, freeze it. When it's time to cook it, put it in the cold water, let it thaw out fast, and you cook it. You leave a, a pot roast out on the counter, room temperature, overnight. But, you know, you leave it in a, a bowl or plate or something because when you do that, it drains. So any juices and blood, there's any that drains into the bottom of the bowl, then you wash it and you start doing the bake process. And the medium well and all that, it drains out. The redder it is, it's cause that's still blood. You right. eating straight blood. So what I do with steak, even at the restaurant, I take the steak and I lamb, and I lamb chops cause lamb chops is gamey. People was tripping on how I, our lamb chops are not gamey. But I do an overnight marinating process. So even when you do a, our steak medium and well, well, well done, a medium rare, you don't see the red in it. Wow. So when a person who is used to like seeing that. the red in, coming in over the there, steak baby. and come and ask for it medium, I mean, well, not well, sorry, almost rare, so to say, and they get the steak and it's not bloody, it's not red, they, they don't look at you like, okay, this is not. But this is this is catch. Sometimes you can get a graph because people that really is steak lovers and they get a steak that's rare, medium rare. You can tell the the temperature of a steak by pressing it. Oh, okay. So if a rare steak is real. I'm talking about real soft. Almost mm -hmm. flip it, flip it, flip it, put it on the plate. But when you marinate it and the juices and the stuff to marinate, you still do the same process. You just don't see the blood running out of. Mm -hmm. Tastes the same. The texture's the same. The look is what sometimes throws and I tell people and I have to go out to the table or one of my cooks will go out to the table and explain it. And they say, fine. But the one thing about, about us, our culture, we really don't know the difference <laughs> between medium and well, well. You tell somebody, well, how would you like it? I want it, um, um, uh, let's do sunny side up. Then you take them a sunny side up with two big yolks looking up at it. That ain't what I wanted. I love sunny side up. They hate it. And then I say, well, you, that, this is what you asked for. Sunny side up. Well, I meant do, do both sides. I say, okay, you want it medium well or do you want it fried hard? I wonder where the yolk is just running and all the white is done. I say, okay, I know, I got you. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we don't, 
we think we know a state and then right. we don't know a state. We right. think we know how we want our eggs. We don't know how we want our eggs. We just, you know, we don't know the correct terminology. So what we do at Breakfast Brothers, I was born and raised and I see these things. I run a restaurant industry. Black people don't like their fish soft. So I tell everybody in the kitchen when I train the cooks, fry the fish and chicken extra crispy. Because if you don't, it's going to come back. How do you know everybody want extra crispy? 90% of our customers are our culture. They don't like soft catfish. Exactly. That's me. That's me. That's everybody. Take it, man. But everybody, <laughs> okay, but having a restaurant, um, everybody, whether from your culture or not, everybody's taste buds and everything is different. Because even like on catfish, I like meaty catfish. He doesn't. He likes it, you know, in between. I like it crispy. He likes it salty. I don't love it salty. So it's like extra seasoning. That's all I tell him. He loves it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the thing. So, I, but how do you cater? How do you weigh all of that into consideration whenever you're cooking for someone? When you got a, when you got a restaurant and you love cooking and you're the one that's creating all the ingredients. Each one of the recipes have different ingredients. What I do when I get ready to add something to a menu or I do, I take it home. And if it's addicting tasting. It doesn't matter to him anymore because he tasted it. And he don't have to worry about having extra seasoning because from the beginning what made him create extra seasoning because he loved catfish, but they're not cooking it. He's got a, he's got a, it's kind of like a song being a similarity of a hit. All you got to do is remake it and make it newer. But you hear in the background something about that song. Well, it was a hit before. Something about where his, his culture made the catfish, he wanted to make this. So what I did is I just took all our culture together and make it addicting tasting where he won't even ask for extra seasoning. Yeah, I got you. Well, we coming over there. We gonna see about that, boy. Yeah. He showed, Rick, hey, Ricky Booker. Yeah, yeah. He he talking mean game. Seven, seven yeah. days a week. Yeah. Okay. Now, I hate to tell y'all. Now I see where y'all at. I'm in Arlington, so you have to take twenty all the way around. I, um, I, I got a gas car because you're gonna be coming back. No, no, no. Let me tell you, I go to the Jamaican <laughs> restaurant yeah, in Arlington, Jamaica Gates. Jamaica Gates. Okay, so yeah, all the time. And there are other Jamaican restaurants around, but I just always love that atmosphere, so I always go. Man, over there. we went to Miami for my birthday a couple weeks ago. We went to Cleves. Oh mm -hmm. my God, a Jamaican restaurant called Cleves in, 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 in Miami. Miami. Oh my. It was, we gotta check it out. Yeah, we gotta it was, check it. It was, it's been there forever. My girlfriend took us because her family background's from Barbados okay. and Miami. So we went to Cleves and man, that place See, was. Oof. I gotta write, I'm gonna write that down because yep. anywhere we travel to, we always go to a Jamaican spot. Yeah, yeah this we is the most powerful one. one in Miami. It's C L I V E S, Cleves. Wasn't there one we go to in New York? There's. Um, New York? No, I can't remember. It wasn't a grill. They had one in, um, in it was Atlanta. It's the same too. one in Atlanta right. that we went to in right. New York. I can't remember the name. I Cleves. thought and I Cleves is a grill, but, but I I'm going to, but in Miami too, I'm going to look it up because I have a friend that I went to school in. He has a really nice restaurant in Miami as well. Okay. So I got to look up the name though. I'm very terrible with names. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have everything on social media and everybody on social media. I can say, hold on, give me a second. Let me look. <laughs> But um, back to your background. So, when you're ra so when did you start finding out that you had a passion for cooking? When when we finally transitioned, when I lived in Oklahoma, I really didn't have to cook much because I can. Anytime I go to my grandmother, she had some food. Every time I, even when my mom was still alive, we go to Oklahoma City. She was cooking. I pull up in the, on a Friday evening. And, Maybe a pot of stew. We sit there eat hot water cornbread and stew. Stop, man. Yeah, hot water like, cornbread. Yo, oh, man. I didn't ever slap my mama, but it would make you slap somebody. <laughs> you you been making a hot water cornbread over no, there? I can make not over there. I don't, but because the breakfast water brothers ain't go really hard, hard. Oh, they go hard, man. You know who got some? I gotta give them a plug. South Dallas Cafe got some. Yeah, we've been Whew. we've been over that there. Hot water cornbread. Hot water cornbread. Is serious. Go in, though. I always tell them, give me two. They put them in them little two sandwich bags. Mm -hmm. Give me two of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so breakfast brothers, what kind of food would you categorize? Because you said it's so you're not the hot water cornbread, so you're not so soul food. What exactly would you, how would you categorize your menu? What I did once we transitioned and, and got a restaurant, I went to all the popular brunch spots <clears throat> and and tried them from the 360s, the Yolk, the uh, uh, breakfast uh, uh, mm -hmm. club when I go to Houston. Yeah, and, and I noticed that. And I noticed each one of them, they close at two o'clock. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I wanted to be able to have a full menu, stay open all day, we can have breakfast. But what I did is, took everybody's maybe their favorite entree that you can have on at dinner and I flipped it. Like lamb chops, you usually have asparagus, mm -hmm. mashed potatoes or mac and cheese. 
nobody ever had lamb chops and eggs. So I flipped it and came up with lamb chops and eggs. I'm pretty sure somewhere in the it. world is probably like that. Right. But then I'm just I'm adding um, salmon and uh, salmon bites, fried salmon bites and eggs. I'm getting ready to add that to the menu. So I test it and I test it with the eggs, the home style, some other potatoes and put it all together. And if it come out right for them, then I got a sauce that I'm making. Then you use it a dipping sauce. So we do catfish and grits. I researched to see if anybody had red velvet waffles in Dallas area. They didn't. So that's one of our biggest I've seen cities. That, I, yeah, I've seen that when we traveled to Atlanta. Yeah, but i never red seen velvet. it in Dallas. Yeah. yeah. So our chicken and waffles. Uh, we do. Uh, like we're going to be going to that tomorrow. You think it's tripping over <laughs> yeah. here. Do no, but I love, I, love the, I love the way how you are being creative with your menu and how it looks and not to be just so traditional like everybody right. else. Because like... Um, Facebook, oh my God, Facebook get me all the time. That's how I got to Turkey Leg Hut. Oh, yeah. I didn't hear Turkey Leg <laughs> Hut from nobody else. It was an ad that popped up on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And and there's another restaurant somewhere in Garland that does tacos and margaritas and stuff like that. I have a list of all these restaurants mm -hmm. that I want to visit whenever <laughs> I'm into these different towns. And because it comes up and then the food just looks so good and it, I like when it's creative. Even like there's a donut spot that used to always pop up that's somewhere in Garland as well. Mm -hmm. But their donuts be so different looking. Right. It makes you want to even like, okay, I got to try that. That's I've never seen a donut looking like that before. I got to try that. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's so, what you have to do. I like the way how you're making things creative. Yeah. yeah. So um, <clears throat> do you, uh, how long you been open? We opened January 26th. So we've been open maybe since January. So January 26th. Okay, okay. Mm. That's dope. Y'all booming. Y'all already booming. Well, it, it was, I'll tell you the niche behind it. I'll start from the beginning. Let's get it. Um, let's get it. Let's get into when it. When we first started, um, um, we started King of Diamonds. Me and my business partners that, had I saw that. strip club King of Diamonds. Y'all saw the King of Diamonds. We didn't start it here in Dallas. We started it. The original King of Diamonds out of mine. Yeah, I've been there. And that's the originator. And, you know, Lenny Moore, he the godfather of the, uh, the whole situation. So we started in... And we got where we was at. We got the building. And we noticed it wasn't a kitchen in it. And one of my business partners said, "Man, we need we need to get this food truck." I was like, "Man, we ain't getting no food truck. We ain't dumped enough money in this renovation." And he said, "Well, man, I'm, I'm I'm gonna find something." So he found something cheap, a little black trailer a guy I used to use for a barbecue truck, and it cost us three grand for it. And we put it back there, got electrical, plugged it in, and got going. You know, I didn't have nothing to do with it, and um business partners got his cooks and got everybody lined up got his menu i said man i love the menu so um they started cooking food was okay but it wasn't good enough for for us right and um so why I, you didn't dip your hands into it at because the time i because cooked at home all the time i didn't want nothing to do with cooking oh, you know okay. my back you know i i done thanksgiving feast i done my kids used to always tell me open a restaurant man i ain't doing that that's too much labor too i ain't much. got time i was in the car business i was managing artists like i told you earlier i managed artists so the music in the car custom car world that's, that's where i was a in. lot of time so i was like really into that i made a living but um as soon as we got the trailer going so i kept saying man we we're just buying inventory and paying these guys to be in this trailer people ain't buying this food and and one day i went in the office and both of them were sitting there and he looked at me and said well you can do better you go do, you do something about it then <laughs> and i said well, you know i i, I will not but i didn't say that but I, you know i said a different story way and then mm -hmm. went downstairs went outside Got in the train and said, you, 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 get the out. Yeah. Wow. Took the keys, locked it up, and I went back upstairs, and they was up there laughing. I said, what's funny? We, I wanted to make you mad because I know you the one, you, you know, you keep telling me about what's going on. So I came up with the menu, redid the menu, got some new cooks in there, started cooking the recipes, and just came up with some ideas, took off. Mm -hmm. People Go. lined up behind that trailer. At uh -huh. the same time, I wasn't... We just serving food for the customers coming to King and Diamond. Yeah. I wasn't still thinking about opening up no restaurant. It's a lot of damn work. You gotta know. <laughs> but, lot, but you have a lot of people who go through King of Diamond, so the word will get out that the food is awesome and stuff like that. That's what. And was people going are on. gonna start asking, "Where can I find this food during the you know mm -hmm. all the hours?" That's and stuff what was like happening. That. So when when that building came to where we got wrongfully put out from a slum lord, mm -hmm. we ended up moving the trailer to Pink Lounge. We had just bought Pink Lounge, the nightclub of Pink Lounge. Moved the trailer over there and started, you know, selling food over there. And a little crowd was coming, you know, nice club, nightclub. And um, got with these three guys that was promoters in in town, you know, three heady, heavy hitters. And they came up with a night called R&B Fridays. Okay. 
So, who was these that promoted? You, you got three of them. It's, they, they names is Willie, Stink, and Thugga Thugga. Hey, <laughs> Willie, Stink, and Thugga wow. Thugga. They, them, boy, them boys to this day, were, they can go find a barn and say we throwing a party and four or five hundred people gonna come. Wow, that's they dope. had that much power in the streets in Dallas when wow. they come to parties. And right wow. now, I think Thugga is over at at Jamie's with with James Price and them doing okay. doing the night over there. But them boys is powerful. We end up and once they got the food, they start promoting, implementing those the, the, that. Cross promoting man, people. We had seven hundred plus people lined up at at a club that only two hundred people probably supposed to be in. Wow! Buying food. I mean, it was popping. Year that's straight. What, that's what's up. Let, let, let me let me ask you about those. You you manage artists. Which artists did you manage? Are you Hold on, but sorry, but before you get into that, how old were you when you started being an entrepreneur? Because that's entrepreneurship right there, managing and doing uh, all that stuff. I probably, I probably was around six or seven. I'm tell you the story. Me and my friends used to, we used to call fruit, I used to made up a deal where we call fruit hunting. Go front and uh, hunting for fruit, apples, cherries, peaches, apricots, and we would jump in people's backyard. We have our bags and we fill them up. So I found an older white lady in our neighborhood. You know, we lived in the, in the projects next to the, to the houses. Found an old lady, she liked making apple pies. So I started going to pick the apples and selling her bags of apples. She's giving us bags of apples for a dollar, you know, now, that, don't, that ain't no money, mm -hmm. but 20 bags of apples, $20, me and two of my friends. Back then, yeah. back then uh -huh. that was some bread. Was it. So I started selling the apples to her. So that when that thing, she ended up, lady ended up dying, and yeah. her, her family tied out. So one day we was at 7-Eleven hanging out, and it was a club next to 7-Eleven, old white. And I remember I used to see an old white, a lot of white people went to this club. There was a lot of people go to that club. And one day it was a guy that came out the building, he was cleaning. And I, I went down and said, hey, mister, um, how about me and my friends dump that trash for you? <laughs> and he said, how much you charge? I said, $20 a piece. You know, by this time, I think we was like 10, 11 years old. It's $20 a piece, that's a lot of money. I said, we dump all the trash. He said, what if you clean up the club every Saturday morning, I'll give y'all $20 a piece. I said, oh, we'll do that. We clean up the old club every Saturday morning, $20 a piece. Did that, man, all the way till we got into high school. Wow. An old white man named Bob used to own it. And when he died, he ended up leaving us a will, but we never got to see what the will was because his wife wouldn't go for it because his wife was racist. Yeah. But he was he liked these three black dudes wow. that he that we cleaned for a decade until we got into high school. And when he died, he I was like him. Yeah, now. so we he may have left us his club. To this day, we don't know that because wow. we never had a chance to see she it. She wouldn't let it be. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't fight something like that when people do that? No. No. Not in those days. Not in those days, especially, you know. Now you could, but yeah. not then. Mm -mm. Mm. So, you know, with those things going on, then then I talked to my friends in something bad. <laughs> 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 this is when the street came in. I think we in the time we was cleaning up the club, you know, the, I remember the 7-Eleven was connected to the club. Right. Yeah. So back in them days, you remember when Jerry Lewis had that muscular dystrophy. Yeah, you know, go yeah. To the 7-Elevens and get the milk cartons. Yeah. And go door to door and they fill it up and you yeah. go take it back to the seven eleven. Well, we never took the milk. Oh, I back. bet. I bet. <laughs> I never heard about that before. Oh, I know. Oh, that was big. I'm older cat. Yeah. So my friends used to say, Man, Ricky, you should just right. I said, Man, how much <laughs> money you think Jerry Lewis taking from them? Oh yeah, that's how you justify it, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way it be. So you didn't answer your question. I, I've been doing things a long time to figure out how to make some what do we call some I paper. See. I see. <laughs> and your friend that was doing it with you. Whatever happened to him? Uh, D'Angelo Irvin. We all still, uh, Michi Shields. Matter of fact, Michi Shields stayed on the in the corner house. He didn't live in the apartment. So he he lived in the white neighborhood because they moved in from Alabama. His daddy was a sergeant in the military. Okay. So they, you know, they, so we yeah. used to go to his house, watch the movies. And, you know, we lived good. When we wanted to leave the apartment, we'd go to his <laughs> house, spend the night. But they all, Michi actually owned his parents' house now. He didn't redid it. D'Angelo, he's got uh, two sons that's probably going to be in the minor league baseball. Both his sons is stupid crazy, but um, they still live in Oklahoma that's City. That's good that they're doing good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to get to my music. I was just about though. to say, so when did you graduate into being a um, producer or a producer recruit, manager? Manager, Man. sorry. So I got in uh, in 90. And how old were you? In 93. How old was I? Maybe 24? He know Dre. Dre, Dre, you been around too long. Oh, Dre, the one used to be owning Evan Eyes. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was yeah. on here too. Yeah. You okay. didn't see that uh -uh. until you seen BC. Go yeah. back and look. You'll see Dre okay. on there. yeah. Big chain guy. Yeah. Shout out to Dre, man. <laughs> but I think in 93 is when we started. 93. Okay. 93. 
I met being 22, 23 years old. Who, who, who did you first manage? This guy out of Oklahoma City, which was a good friend of mine too, Tony Briggs named Teaspoon. Teaspoon. But when I got into music, <laughs> Tony Thompson with High Five was my wife's, um, they mothers or sisters. At this time, Tony lived in Oklahoma City. That was when, the lead singer. That was the lead singer. When he got his deal, it was the original High Five group was Toriano, where he was from Oklahoma City. Him and Tony was best friends. Okay. And Tony was raised part of his life in Oklahoma City. When he got their deal, to, he brought Tori. And they came out to Waco and got three guys that was his friends too. And right when they was getting launch, Tory, you know, he was a young 16, 17 game bangings and he ended up killing somebody and went going to prison. But they had already did all the recordings. So one of the members named Treston they brought from New York was actually doing Toriano's parts because wow. he had the deep voice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got in, I was around that era. And then when Tony kind of went solo, uh, Jonathan Kinlock was his uh, manager. I kind of got in there and kind of watched it and learned from that. Took the game, managed Teaspoon. Then um, B Hemp came around. Then I already living in Texas Shout by out B -Hemp. B -Hemp, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he used to bring me songs when we lived in Mansfield all the time and he had all his friends on. I said, man, quit bringing me songs. You you and Nita in the Haystack. You wanted me to listen to these songs as a compilation and you got to listen to 100 Brothers before I get to you. So one night, my son was getting to cut his hair, and I heard Ricky in there saying, go give it to him, go give it to him. So he came there, hey, big Ricky. And I said, yeah, I mean, I got another song. So we with this again, man, here we go. Now it's just me by myself. And I said, who produced it? Brandon produced it. I'm going to tell you who Brandon is. I said, okay. Went out in my car, <laughs> started listening to the song. Song came on. Doo -doo 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 -doo. I was like, rewind it. Listen to it again. I was like, man, this is kind of catchy. I went in the house, <laughs> left the car running in the garage. This you, you did this? And he said, yeah. I looked at him and walked off. And by this time, it was like midnight. So I called the local DJ named G Rock that was working on 97. Yeah, yeah, I know. Hey, man. Oh, I heard you. I, I need you to uh, I come by my office tomorrow. I need you to listen to something. That's when I had a car shop. I had a custom car shop with George Lynch, the NBA basketball player. Okay. So he, he came over there. And he was listening to it, and he said, who is this? I said, it's be him. He said, I don't know who that is. I said, well, well, regardless, don't worry about it. He said, man, I like that. And then he said, come on, let's go eat. So we went and ate. So he called uh, DJ Drop that was with, with Definition DJ. Hey, mm -hmm. Drop, man, I need you to uh, listen to a song with me and get behind him. We're going to do Texas Trill DJs, and we're going to do... Uh, 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 the Dallas Drop, the you know Drops DJs, I feel, uh, Definition DJs, and Drop said, "Man, I got to hear it first And and G Rock said, "Okay, cool." So he hung up. G Rock said, "Man, I ain't got time for him to be listening to it. I'm, we often roll with this." <laughs> he started playing it, called me and said, "Man, I want B Hemp to open up on Sunday over here at Ribbon City. That's when Ribbon City on Sundays used that, to be yeah. insane." And I called B Hemp and said, "Man, you got to perform Sunday. Do the Ricky Bobby song." And he said. Okay, cool. And then I said, come to the house. He came to the house. I said, okay, man, show me the Ricky Bobby. And he said, the Ricky, what do you mean? <laughs> so, it's, it's a dance you telling people to do the Ricky Bobby. Bobby stop, pose for yeah, the he, said, he didn't just, have to dance yet. I just got one, I got one move. And I said, what? You got one move? So, you know, I tell, this this is a true story. So, I said, I know who I call. He's a choreographer. He used to be in High Five. His name Jay Smooth. You probably need to get him on the show, okay. too. Okay. And uh, he from Fort Worth, Jonathan Stewart. Man, I need you to come up with a dance for me. He came to the house, we was over there at three in the morning, him and B. Ham going at it. <laughs> yeah, that's it, we're gonna do this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it. He went to, uh, and he said, now I want you to perform it. So he started performing. He messed up. <laughs> he started, no, not on the dance, cause B. Ham, he could dance. Okay. He started rapping the song and I was like, you forgetting the words, that ain't what he said. <laughs> he said. He said, I just recorded it, Rick. I said. <laughs> Well, damn. Okay, this will just leave the music in it. You yeah. just, you just, the words you don't know, don't say nothing. Let it go. <laughs> let it roll. Let it, let it roll. Mm -hmm. So we did that the next day. He went and performed at Ribbon City the next night. Turned it up. History from there. Yeah, that's really, hey, mm -hmm. that, that boy killed that, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so was that, okay, and after that, you had to work with somebody else. Who else did you work yeah, with? I worked with Lil Ronnie. Yeah, Lil Ronnie. Lil, Early Lil on or? It was later on. That, Early on, he had been with other management team other later, probably in 2000. What songs was around when you worked with Lil Ronnie? When I was managing Ronnie, he uh, 
who had his deal with uh, Dirty Water. Okay. And he had a uh, uh, man, uh, my which is my favorite to this day. Is, is to me is a classic. New Year's Re- Resolution. Resolution. That song. And um, that that song go hard. Oh, that mm-hmm. song, man. That to song this go day, hard. that song. Remember, I talked to him mm-hmm. about it. You, you know. You know Kind of like Tony, Tony, Tony got that song anniversary. Oh, that's mm-hmm. dope. Yeah, that's Lil the Ronnie song. Every year, New Year's resolution, they sing. It gave me chills when you see when he used to, we used to go on the road and he would perform it. People would be singing it word for word. Wow. D boys, you know, street Everybody. next street people. I mean, it's like I used to have goosebumps. Yeah. Wow. And Lil Ronnie be performing it after a while. He don't even have to really perform it. All he would just do is just. And just, everybody yeah, else yeah, they loved it. it. Oh my God! And every year, that song come back around and do the exact same thing. Wow. Mm-hmm. So you think that's his number one song? Oh man, to by far. He got so many number. Lil Ronnie is so artistic, man. To where he he knows a hit, but with the the world that we're in now. They don't understand hits no more. Okay. They just understand numbers. So now he understands how to work the numbers along with the ones that's supposed to be hits. To me, he's not selfish. He's the most unselfish besides Fat Pimp too. Them two, I yeah. manage him he too. They're the, the most un, unselfish rapper. They can do songs. They can give people songs away because they can turn around and go do more songs. Mm-hmm. They don't wow. worry about none of that because they know that's how to, to do hear. Rap. You know right, that? Right, right. That pimp was just here, man. Yeah. Love this show too. Both of them. They both blessed, yeah. the, blessed the platform. People. Yeah. Yeah. And I managed yeah. fat, fat as well. Yeah, he was he definitely was here. He say uh he talked about different things that he went through. Oh yeah. You know, oh different yeah. Different stuff that 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 I believe, you know, he, he talked about being the name Fat Pimp mm-hmm. and he kinda grew to a point where he felt kinda mm-hmm. like He I, wanted he wanted to lose the pimp part of it. Yeah, but he mm-hmm. couldn't. It, it then was, he came up with a, a Spanish version, Gordo. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then yeah, he also talked about the pills and everything and right. going through his situation, man. You know, life is something else, mm-hmm. man. God has a way of leading you through. No matter how you feel like you're doing something, he's the one leading the direction. Right. Right. You ain't doing nothing. Right. And that's what that's what I was gonna tell you. Out of all the music and the cars that I put wheels and tires and paint and interior I put in and the artists I match in the clubs and the big parties that I was involved in, it was decent. All the stuff that I used to do at home, I come home dead be tired sometime. And my kids say, Man, Daddy, would you make some spaghetti? I go in there and whip up a spaghetti in forty five minutes for with some toast. I always cook for them. And they be sitting there and I like to see people happy. Yeah, I be dead be tired. Most my servants, kids used most to be servants happy. do. Most restaurant owners yeah. do. We have a lot of friends yeah. as restaurant owners. When they when they happy, my Food kids makes be happy. people happy. Yes, it does. And that's where I came up with the we came up with the model where we feed your soul. Wow. Because you're not touching somebody's soul, then food is nasty. <laughs> 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 it's like I thought, like you know, unfortunate I went through it, but everybody one day had to go through it. Vice versa. However, I was married 27 years, and with my kids' mom, 30 years. Wow. But married 27. See, I, I meant to ask you that because I heard you mention wife. But I heard at first I heard you mention girlfriend, and yeah. I'm like, okay, so that means he was married. Yeah, I was married 27 years. It's, wow. You know, it was a it was a it was a hard breakup, but at the end of the day, it taught taught me a lesson and something my family a lesson too to to where sometimes you can hold on things too hard, and once you have to let them go, even though that you may be unhappy and you still stay because of certain reasons, as a man. And what you were saying that about the women of old well, boys done, as a man, I don't care how good you think you had it, how good you raised your family and took care of everybody. When you make a decision and leave a home after that long, they don't, you're not like, they don't like you. Yeah. Yeah, it was a real unpleasant time in my life with my children and with my ex-wife. Really? But how we got, old were your children at the time? Man, this was... Five years ago, so it was oh. in two, maybe four, two thousand seventeen when it happened. So they, they were, were all grown, grown. They right. were grown, but they still had issues. Oh what they, you know, it's like you know, like your kids younger now, fifteen, sixteen, maybe fourteen, or however. You expect them, you expect that expectation from them. But my youngest was, I think Greek was twenty eight, and they <laughs> acted like fourteen, fifteen year old, which that surprised me. But we had been, they didn't know no other man around their mother besides me. Yeah. So they at the point at that point in time they can get down how big a house they stayed in how many new cars they had in the driveway I was leaving and they didn't yeah. care why but the one thing about it you can be unhappy and rich but the most unpleasant thing to be unhappy and broke but even when those things I can be broke rich or however just gotta have a peace of mind mm-hmm. 
Yeah. You don't have a peace of mind is unpleasant. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. living. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did a lot of stuff too. I mean, I'm pretty sure on both of y'all sides. Everybody always be like, well, I've been happily married for 20-something years. Yeah. Nobody's happily married for that long. No. Uh, you go through different bumps and bruises, and, <clears throat> you know, and, and people evolve, and they go through things. You just, like I said, my biggest thing is to keep God at the center of my mm -hmm. life. And um, no matter what, that that's just, that's the most important element for me. And that's what I, that's where I started saying when y'all was talking about keeping God in your life, and when you don't pay attention, or I won't say necessarily pay attention, but when you don't figure out the vision and the purpose that God had for you, when you finally do, how it flourishes. Breakfast Brothers is what I was, regardless if it was Breakfast Brothers, regardless if it was a food industry, period, is what I was supposed to be doing. I was doing it at home and making everybody and all of my friends and all my kids' friends every year in November and Thanksgiving come to my house. My house on Thanksgiving Day was like the club. Yeah, <laughs> I had so much food, people came and ate the door, swinging like 7-Eleven just to eat. They knew they can come to the bookers on, on Thanksgiving days. M Squared used to work here in 979. Well, he used to have to work every year on the radio station. I would take him, he, he never had sweet potato pie because I think M Squared is Haitian or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I used to take him a whole sweet potato pie and a plate to the radio station. It'd be like nine, ten o'clock at night. He'd be on the radio station eating. That was his tradition. He called me Thanksgiving morning. He wake up, hey, you got me, Rick? I said, yeah, I got you. Yeah, I would take him Thanksgiving wow. food That's up there. Dope, so man. once I finally seen from the black little black shack to where we are, from all the clubs and how the food progressed, people liked liked our ingredients and liked the food. So that's where Breakfast Brothers came about. We just said, you know what, and we did it and. and and man, when I say God has opened the doors that that I was always I was always at the door, but I never crossed in it. Mm, in the you room. know, when I went to <clears throat> Breakfast Breakfast Club mm -hmm. uh, in Houston, when I went, I went at you wasn't with me. I was no, by myself. The first time. I was by myself, and I went at I think they opened up at ten o'clock at night. They closed for a minute, and then they opened back mm -hmm. up at night. And I went there because they told me at the hotel go to you go at ten, you can get in and get your food, and you ain't got to worry. I went there, and as I stood in line, I was probably like the second person, or third. When you come in, you they clap, they clap. <laughs> then they then you come in and you you order you order your food before you sit down. Right. Everybody always order their food before they sit down. Yep. They don't even they don't go to the table and somebody come. They order their food. Mm -hmm. Then you go there and you sit down at a table and you wait for that food. And that was different for me. I hadn't seen people doing it right. like that. But I, I, I understood it. And they had people that worked there that would bring you stuff. Mm -hmm. But they made sure that they that you ordered when you came through the door and that they showed the appreciation for you coming. Mm -hmm. That's dope. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, it's just a yeah. I'm just I'm just thinking about mm -hmm. when I went. And you know what? In saying that, I never really thought about <clears throat> it before. You know how you just go places and you don't think about certain things until you're in a certain business or somebody bring it to your awareness. So with you saying that, because I've been to restaurants where – I've been seated. Somebody came in who've been seated after me, but they got their order in and their food before me. So in this way, when you're coming in and you order it before you sit down, that mix-up should never happen. It still does, though. Really? I'm going to tell you the reason why. When you're inside of the kitchen, just say the first five orders is a longer process. Say it's... Uh, wings, because wings take longer to cook, and you got five orders of wings, whole wings. And then next thing you know, the next two is catfish. Catfish take twelve minutes to cook, mm -hmm. right. so you're gonna hold up these orders and hold back up your whole line or get those two out. So you gotta sometimes get, you got to get it out. You got to get it out. And I knew. I felt. I understood. That. Yeah. And what happens is people take notice of that, mm -hmm. and when you do it, you you if they looking. What I used to always tell my waitresses to this day, and even if it would cook, I had to go out there and tell them, say, excuse me, y'all food's coming right up. I know they got y'all, they got theirs first, but seafood cook a little faster. So we still That's we still crazy. cooking yours. Which it's is take good because minutes. people don't explain. No. And a lot of times I sit down here and I'm looking, I'm like, I know they came in after me, but I'm hungry too. And <laughs> this happens to Breakfast Brothers now. When you, we got what you call Get In Line as an app. You can either go on our website or either you can go, when you come in, you get on it. It's called get in line. It automatically gets you in line. And then when your table's ready, it texts you. So say you driving from Box Springs and you know Saturday morning and Sunday we busy, you get in line. Oh, that's cool. And you get in line on your way. And if Steve and Susie is already there waiting on the table, you come right in. And as soon as you're going up, you say, oh, who are you? And you say, 
uh, Mr. Maker plus one. Okay, yeah, we got you coming up in five minutes. In five minutes, the table come. You come out, and Steve and Susie's been they gonna there. They're going to be, my, they gonna be they so mad. Looking, like, and then we've had to explain people, oh, they got in line either on their way or sitting on their couch at home. So that's almost like reservations, like you're calling and making reservations, but you're just doing it on an app. Yeah, but what we do is every time somebody, just like you say, we don't say reservations because reservations is hoes. Get in line, you get in line. It's a get in line app that they do and that you have, and it's an app that comes out and you come. You can be the fifth person in line, but sitting at your house. Wow. Instead of the fifth person in line on site. So that fit, that person may be the tenth person in line on site, but you the fifth person getting off your couch coming in. Wow. I like it. I mean yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but okay, so Okay, uh, um sorry. But something I wanted to go back to what? is um I've seen you've you've managed so many people and I'm sure you've managed others than the ones that you've already mentioned. Why okay, being a manager why do you? Why do they move on? Why do don't you keep? Because they're successful people. Why wouldn't you keep those? People? Because this is this is this is why I, this is how I manage artists. You know, be hemp fat, and Ronnie Ronnie is so knowledgeable. All of them is knowledgeable and stuff. But I manage them the business to where nowadays I'm gonna keep it real. I may get popped across my head by some other managers nowadays. When you have a a powerful artist and he understands the business, he don't necessarily need the manager anymore because every th- you create your stores by streaming. The more music that you drop now, the more money you make. You don't necessarily have to go get on stage and see nobody pay for a ticket to come to see you anymore. If you drop enough music, you may be getting checks quarterly, three or $4,000, and some artists now is comfortable. So the ma- artists that I've managed to that point, they in the area where they comfortable about where they at. They don't necessarily, I won't say quote, quote, need a manager anymore because they know how to book themselves. They know how to drop their own music. They know how to shoot their videos. Half Paint is a platform for half of them. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Half Paint. He's been on Right, here. and they know how to respectfully talk in their own business. They know how to talk to PDs. All that. I, when I got them, I used to, do, me, B, Hemp, and Fat Pimp, and even Ronnie days when he was with, they, we went door to door to radio stations and introduce the artist to the PD. So now if the artist had to go back to the PD, he don't need his manager for that. Right, he already know how he to. He already know how to do those mm-hmm. things. So those channels, I, I don't necessarily want to be attached to an artist all my life because sometimes, I'm going to keep it real, it's hard because sometimes it's like babysitting. They have their own personalities and they want to do certain things. And sometimes with me, they all know. Some, I used to have, a, it's Ricky's way or there's no way. Okay. So when, when, when they leave, it's not necessarily that the paper they sign off and we disconnect, we just never resign and they get to doing their own thing because the knowledge that they have, I don't have to have a re-op, an option to resign them to keep them around because they, they talented. And then one thing that they know, I can get pick up the phone, call any of them, they pick up right away. If I need them to do anything and they need me to do anything, it's likewise. Right. Because so that became a relationship instead of a manager and that's artist so, business. That's so crazy because I know because when I think about managers and I think about okay, you get an artist and they're as they're getting bigger and bigger, number one, your pocket getting fatter and fatter. And like why would you want to let go of that person? You'd want them to re-sign with you because there you can see them going, you know, all the way to the right. top and you would like to be there by their sides going all the way to the top because number one, it gives you more recognition because yes, people already will know that you're their manager at this stage, but when they get to that stage, everybody won't know if you're not there with, right. you, with that person. And I would answer that point too. I get, I got to the point where the transition and where music changed, I changed. I quit hustling. When I say hustling, it's so hard to understand to put our artists in the platform. And once you get, when the music changed to where it changed to the, to the digital side of things and the streaming side of things, I had to learn that all again because right. the hustle bustle, even with my brother BC, we know that hand-to-hand promotion and how to move around them street promotions is powerful. They still powerful to this day. But once that game started to where they dropped their music and they made so much money, at the end, I'm a true believer. When I manage people, I even didn't take a percentage. If if one of the artists, you call the artist and say, hey man, I need to, I need to do a feature with uh, one of the artists, I'd be like, okay, cool. And I connected. They kept that money. I didn't take a percentage of it mm. because I feel like they're publishing and they're writing, they're writing, they go in the studio and mix, that's their money. 
They go do their work. I'm at home <clears> laying <throat> down in the bed, so why should I but take a percentage of that? But that's your choice because normally, normally managers don't do that, the, right? That was always no, my choice. It's, it's just, it's just how you choose to manage. So, so once it came to the point where they faded, they had the opportunity where I resigned. Them, but at the point I was at the point in my life, and they all know that I just really didn't want to do it no more. Mm. Well, I, I think it also uh, evolves around the fact that, that you evolved, and and also. That, like you said, the cooking thing, that's where you were supposed to be the whole time. Yeah. God already had something planned and prepared for you, and he showed you when you was over there when you started messing with that truck. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And and so he has a way of touching you on the shoulder mm-hmm. and just getting you prepared for where he's taking you to. Mm-hmm. And you don't even you don't even think of it that way. It, you don't even know how you got to it. Right. But you arrive there, and you right. know that's where you're supposed to be. But the music part of it is still in me. So I, I believe I got, that. I got, yeah. a, I got a couple of artists that's, that I signed. Who you, who, you, who you working with right uh, now? Uh, Stay Down Lil B. Stay Down Lil B. I never heard never of him. Heard that yeah. he, I'm going to look him up. He, he how long co- you been having him? Uh, a year now. Mm. He actually has his own clothing line. Mm. And uh, he's he does some of the some of the. Some of the hot parties around on Sundays. Okay. Rap or R and B? Rapper. Rapper. Kind of got down a, little B. Yeah. How did you find him? I've been knowing Lil B a long time. He used to be part of the, the group, the Paper Chasers, when they had the uh song Frankie. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. I know that. So, song. you know, he was part of that part of that group. And See, Trey I'm, and all of them. It's so crazy. I'm one of these people that know all the songs so. but don't know who's <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know Frankie because of uh, our employee. Yeah. She used, she was with the with league one. guy. No, but I knew the song too. It came yeah. on the radio. I heard the song. Okay, and then who's the other one? Uh, Nard. You know, Nard the Nard. tattoo artist. He's a tattoo, tattoo artist. artist. Okay. But he does music. Uh-huh. He's a rapper. He's good at it? Mm-hmm. And uh, then I've been having him for probably about a year, but he's been rapping for years too. So I hadn't transitioned and got them in position yet because, of course, I've been focused on different on things. And now I'm transitioning back to the music a little bit. And the last one I just signed, I just signed this kid probably a couple of weeks ago. His name's Austin Graham, white kid. That yeah, he's supposed to be familiar. coming on the show. That's the name sound familiar. He's coming on the show. Yeah, I was about to say. I already say. sent you the name. Yeah, so, yeah. Those, so those three the, right BC there. BC must have called you and was like, you want to have him on the podcast? No, B, no, no um, BC, uh, Amber probably, the publicist probably okay. been setting it up. So okay. she do a lot of PR. She do all the PR for... Uh, for Breakfast, for Brothers, Breakfast as well. Brothers as well. Wow. So, Who came so, up with the name Breakfast Brothers? T- uh, the story behind... Um, you have good, a story for everything. Uh, yeah, because, <laughs> you know, you, I do... I, 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 your success only comes from the visions of what the stories you bring count. If, if it ain't a story, then I don't think you really put the sweat and tears into it. Mm-hmm. Well, one of my business partners that was part of King of Diamonds at the time, he had a logo. And I said, where did you get this from? He said, I made his logo. I got an idea. You know, he can't cook. But, you know, he loved to eat. He had the logo, and that's where we that's where we started. He didn't have a menu or nothing, so I helped with the menu when he started the Black Trader. When I told you he bought the Black Trader, so he he created that logo probably so, maybe two thousand before. So that's your secret partner. Mm-hmm. No, he's not. <laughs> he's, he, he's, not <laughs> he's, he's not the brother. He's not, he's not the secret brother. partner. But so you have more than one partner in this. No, nah, it's just one partner. Just one partner. He, um, uh, the original one that that that. Actually, is my one of my brothers too. I've been knowing him for twenty five years, probably as long as I've been living here in um, Dallas. His name is D Will. A lot of people know him. His nickname is D Will, but he owns AOD and he does a lot of things. And but um, the, he let me have the logo. Wow! Awesome. And I and the concept of I was like, who's the two dudes? Them as characters. So the true true nature of the Breakfast Brothers is me and my other business partner, which I'm on launch on the tv show but you know at the this thing the attachment that we have to even with the logo the we wanted the architect to implement the colors in the mm-hmm. restaurant mm-hmm. so you look at the logo you go to the restaurant you see the red and white the black just the, like our colors right red white and black pa- part of those all the logos implemented throughout the restaurant mm-hmm. but the number one thing that we I, we wanted to have them do so we would never forget where we come. You gotta understand when I say you could, we come. This food really came from the from the blood, sweat, and tears. Is when that little black trailer in the summertime it didn't have AC, mm. so we had all the doors open, the windows open, and propane tanks hanging out the back. We was doing cooking. We didn't know what every in any second this thing could blow it up and mm. kill everybody. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wires hanging out of it. So in the wintertime. It'd be freezing, so we would shut all the doors okay, and on. open up. I just thought about that. When he was saying all of this stuff, I mean, it didn't get inspected. No, that's why we ended up getting pushed, so I'm going to get to that. 
the more of the story <laughs> is. So in the wintertime, we fro- it was freezing, so we shut all the doors and we opened up the fryer. So, you know, in the old days where they opened the oven and let the whole house get the heat, that's how we used to do it. And every time wow. somebody comes and says, shut the door. Yeah. <laughs> so then when it poured down raining, it leaked. Mm. So in the summer, we burned up. In the wintertime, we froze. And when it rained, it leaked. Man. So we didn't never want to forget about where we came from. So the, the little black shack, the border of the walls inside the restaurant is made out of the tin of the little black shack. Awesome. And it's painted black in the front of the retail counter and the side of the walls. Man. Do you have a picture of that little black shack so you can have mm-hmm. it posted somewhere? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. That's, That's dope. That's what we call it, little black shack. That's dope. One mm-hmm. of the cooks named it little black shack. Wow. So the little black shack. All right, then. So when we come, <laughs> when we going over there to eat, girl? And what's going the address eat, anyway? It, we, we're there seven days a week, Sunday through Thursday mm-hmm. at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Fridays mm-hmm. and Saturday, 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. And what's the address? East Barton Road, Alton, Texas, 130 East, East Barton, Barton Road. Road. All right. Okay, yeah. okay. What, what, we, what? Um, <clears throat> what's the best day to come? Uh, anyway. If you don't want to in and out, I would say Monday. Yeah, because we, we were going to sit down and eat. Yeah, so Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday would be a good day. So we're gonna, what, Thursday Monday. through Sunday? Jam packed. Jam packed. So Monday. Hour or two hour waits. In the evening. Monday evening. Mm-hmm. After Bible study. Mm-hmm. Bam, we over there. Yep. Ooh, no, no. We can't do it after Bible study. Bible study starts at 6 45 and don't finish till about 9. Yeah, we we long gone. We sitting at home watching uh, Netflix at that time. Yeah. Right after lunch. <laughs> after lunch. He said Monday. <laughs> Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. We can do Tuesday. Okay. If we don't have a show. We usually have a show. Then have often. the show at. Oh, well, y'all can't have it. I was going to say, have the show well, at the restaurant. We can. We can. Yeah, we are about to launch. Mobile. Yeah, because I'm going to Atlanta. Okay. I got to go down there and do some shows. Okay. We're going to start doing do some mobile. interviews. I got people down there. I got to go okay. see. So when cool. you're having your big events and stuff like that, we'll come we'll and do up. it there. I'll pull up okay. and do it. Well, we yeah, I'll bring I the microphone. I definitely everything. let y'all know, but um, we're getting ready to do two more locations. So I'll let oh, y'all yeah? know that. So when the grand opening comes, yeah, we can call you. Yeah, we'll come. Where I want to get y'all on, we I actually got a cooking show for the start on CW33. We own we own CW right um, on the um, with. Cloud, Cloud. Oh, Cloud Records. Yeah, okay. yeah. He got he got a show called on, Famous. Okay, we're on, on there. What July? It's coming out July the third. Third, we'll be on At that. Our noon. first show start July tenth. So Saturday. how can I get in there? Yeah, his is every, every Saturday. Saturday. I got to put both time in there. Some kind of way. I'll get Amber to call you and we because I got fifty two episodes. I got to shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I need time is yours on Saturday? Twelve thirty p.m. to one p.m. And his is at twelve o'clock every Saturday. Yeah. That's and, crazy. And thir- and Twelve o'clock p.m. So I come on after him. Yeah, you come on right after him. Yeah. <laughs> and you're gonna hit me. I'm we gonna be right there on okay. the too. Yeah, man, I'm back. I'm, <laughs> hey, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> That's so crazy. Man, that's the way, the, you know, the Jefferson used to come on, and I think Jefferson be on Archie Bunker, then they had their own show, Yeah, that's too. exactly yeah, that's how we gonna roll. Hey, man, since you mentioned that, <laughs> since you mentioned that, I remember we used to watch the Jeffersons, and I love that show, and then we used to watch Archie Bunker, but when I got older, if you go on YouTube and watch an episode of Archie Bunker, he was the racist, racist. Dude Oh, yeah, I, I know it, I know seen, it, I knew man. it. He talked about Jews, Oh, yeah, blacks, everything. And we sitting there laughing oh, and giggling. Oh, it was funny. It was like, didn't know better. When we I grew up, I was like, what? My mama didn't let us watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and no. then they made him the chief for police of Mississippi where they tried to clean him up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember camera. that. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was, yeah, he was. Heat of the night. Heat of the night. Yeah. yeah. What else? Funny. Yeah, man. So what, what else we got? <laughs> <laughs> we went from Archie, okay. from Cook, <laughs> from TV show to Archie Bunker. We definitely coming uh, over there. Lord say the same next week. Mm-hmm. We'll right. be coming through. Right. I hope you'll be there. I'll, I'll be there. I'll be, be there. I'm there seven days a week. Okay. That'll work. Okay, you going to Samaria? I'm going to his restaurant. You bring them kids? We know, we know my son going to go because yeah, all, it's food. He love food. Uh, he's going to cook. Every he's restaurant. very picky. <laughs> he's a very picky eater. But, okay, because, like, for us, we've had up to six different locations with this business. Uh-huh. Um, and you said you're about to open two. Mm-hmm. How... It was doable, but the thing that I didn't like with having multiple locations, that's me personally, is the fact that I could not control the customer service in all of them. Because people are coming looking for you. Mm-hmm. Spread yourself They to you. want mm-hmm. your customer service. No matter how much you train people to be like you, a lot of times people are not you. Yeah, this this is the thing that, that, that I put in place. Because on this food truck, even in the black trailer, people used to like, is Ricky cooking tonight? And they'd be like, nope. Uh, all right. 
and they would leave or sometimes they would just go ahead and buy something anyway. Mm -hmm. But when you say you have to help somebody, like you really do have to find somebody that's, that's like you. That's so hard though. It, these days it really is because nobody really, nobody really cares about work no more because everybody want to be entrepreneurs. But at the end, at the end of the day, it's, that's the reason why, that's what, it's so hard to manage artists now because I remember it was a time when we went to a club and you look in the audience, you see all the fans. Mm -hmm. The same audience you look in the back then, they all now behind you because they're waiting to perform. So they ain't no more fans no more, everybody's artists. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying. You, they don't want to be called fans no, anymore too. They no, want to be called supporters. Or supporters or <laughs> hire is, or behind the scenes people. But at the end of the day, somebody, I always say this in every interview. Mm -hmm. The most powerful thing is, and you know, it's a movie. Is a, is a, I think it's based on true facts. It's called The Grave Digger. This guy was a grave digger to put his all his daughters through school, you know, being doctors, lawyers, and all that. And I always say, now it's two categories. You can buy the shovels or you can manufacture the shovels. And which one you want? You want to be the person that did the graves? I want to manufacture. You want to manufacture. So back in them days, the manufacturer made a killing. So now they got... The same way, you can be the caliper driver to dig the grave, or you can be the one that manufactured the caliper. Mm. You know, I, I, that that country saying caliper, I don't know, maybe I'm saying it wrong or right, mm. but it's that's where we gotta figure out. And then sometimes when you figure it out as a business owner, I say this in every interview, so people already say it, you gotta be willing to write everybody a check, whether you pay them every week or every two weeks, and never get paid. Oh, that's yeah. true. Yeah, we know that. We we've done that many so times. So that's sometimes where the understanding comes from being a business owner, entrepreneur, or worker, or a boss, or the individual that takes the directions. You open all your businesses up to train everybody to be bosses. Exactly. And somewhere in that fold, twofold, you you can eventually be on autopilot and have as many as restaurants you want to, it'll just be the face. I won't be the face anymore. So that's why we had it built as a franchise. So when it turns into that, everywhere you go, the Breakfast Brothers look the same. The same food and the same taste. That's the reason why. in and out Burger, successful. That's the reason why. Chick-fil-A is successful. And McDonald's is... But when you think that. about McDonald's and you watch the McDonald's movie that started out with, they wanted it this way and not to expand into what the other man wanted it to be, Crockett? Yeah. Right, but, and the two men that started it at first, they wanted to, to say a certain way, they didn't want that growth, they didn't want this, they didn't want that. They were cool with the franchise, but it had to be a certain way. But Crockett saw the future as in what would make it better. But with doing this, you have that bumping the heads and not being able to, so what I'm saying that is that when you have a business over here and have a business over here, and no matter how much you train them, people are not gonna still be you, as in like have that same mindset. So, so th that's the reason why you put systems in place. Then after that point, they don't have to be you. It's just a system that they buy and buy. McDonald's has a system. It's the same system every day, repetitions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in and out Burger, Chick-fil-A, it's the same system. Even if it comes to the point they have to, Chick-fil-A have to batter that, chicken and put it in freezer bags and, and all they're doing is dumping it in the grease. Mm -hmm. It's the system, one through 10. So all they gotta do is follow the system. So do you think that, um, which one is better? Opening multiple business for you and running them all, assigning different people or opening franchises and selling the franchise? From the beginning, open multiple business for us. And the reason why is because it's unfair if you start selling franchises and you're not able to say, okay, here's your book. You got to take a week of orientation. And this is how you, you know you got to buy this many plates. You got to pay this amount of money, open up this many employees. This is how much capital you got to have for six months for payroll. And if you tell them, okay, your franchise is going to be $700,000. You got to have 250,000 equity. It's got to be right to them. You got to have 150% of support and they understand it. And, and it runs just like Joe Five or however you did. Then you franchise it. Now it's going because now at this point you got you got a system that you handing over somebody that they buying. Is that your end goal? Mm -hmm. To start mm -hmm. having franchises but eventually. It's only I'm gonna give the franchise and we're gonna give the franchise to the people that's in that first realm of those first ones that we open. Then they'll go from there to there. 
the hardest thing is to get you right to get people to be you. But the easy thing is to find the right people to put the systems in. That's yeah. it. Exactly, because yeah. that's the thing that I was thinking about because it was always hard because when we meet people and they seem like they have that drive and they want to do but they want to own their own business one day. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, when we started this business, I wasn't able to go and start from here and work from here in that same business mm -hmm. willing with a person who owned that business that they are willing to tell me the ins and outs now, of I'm gonna ask that you this business. question. I'm going to ask you a question now. Okay. Was you the body or was you the brain? It's got to be one of the two. You can't, if you're putting a system in, you got to have somebody with the brain. Because if you're just a body, that system is never going to come in play. You're going to have to find somebody that's going to be the brain. How's the brain? Okay. That's the reason why you and him are working out so much of as good as partners. And when this started, to couldn't to point where well, I should say half a brain. We both have right. a, so, We both put it you know, together. And I, and really, I'm, you're a little bitty I'm, I'm gonna share, Whatever. I'm going to huh? share something else, too. Don't to, come at me. To what, I, what, I, what I, I know I'm getting, I like telling stories. No, so you're fine. I, I, my grandfather and my dad used to tell me a lot of stories. So one thing that I used to pay attention to, and this don't have nothing to do with racism. racism this is just I love facts. stories, by the way. So I tell you, remember, you know, I'm telling my age anyway. Remember when Kentucky Fried Chicken, they used to have those commercials and Colonel Sanders used to be sitting there next to that tree with the cane dressed in all that mm -hmm. white. You remember what was behind him? The chicken, right? No, I'm talking about when he was sitting in that grass with that tree next to that tree and that commercial going. As it's going off, oh, you see Colonel Sanders. Well, there's a big white house behind him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's yeah. standing on the tree with a big white house in the background. Mm -hmm. So what do you think that house was? Was that the I plantation? Mm -hmm. Why you think the original recipe was a original recipe, secret original recipe? Because it came from a slave that cooked in the house. He mm -hmm. didn't know the damn recipe. Wow. <laughs> so, but he but he definitely made a lot of money off of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and didn't probably give them none. <clears throat> and, and and when we grew up, if, if my daddy came home with a bucket of original recipe, boy, that was boy, that was that amazing. was big. That, that was, was major. Big. You know. Churches, we you know we expect the church, but when he came in that bucket with that KFC, oh, it was on. See, we didn't have churches at home, but we did have KFC. Yeah, we K do have KFC in Jamaica. Yeah, yeah. And so, that was a Friday thing. Every Friday, we yeah. get that KFC. But so what you do think you, about that? What do you think is the biggest mistake that you made in all these ventures? I know you made a lot of them. Oh yeah, a lot. Yeah, you have to make them in order to get to where we are, where we become, where we've been. The, the whole of business for that, that many years, or do different businesses. What's one of the biggest mistakes that Ricky Booker made? Let me combine two questions. Oh, no, no, no. You've been talking for no. the long time. <laughs> yeah, come on, yeah. Ricky Booker, what was it? This, this is, I want, I, I'm looking the cameras on these. Do you? you can look in that okay. one right there. I want, you know, I look in it real quick, back back to the point. The biggest thing that anybody can do is business. You know, you, you put, your, put your loved ones in position to where it almost make them dishonest because they be around a certain dollar figure, certain some way to hustle inside the business. So my biggest, to me, I think me and all my business partners made this mistake to put people in position to maybe either be dishonest, steal from you, or either maybe be in position to where they run your business in ground. Putting people in positions that shouldn't be in because they was either family members or close family members. Okay. And that's rare. And I like, I try to teach my, um, our daughter and I try to tell her because in people you find either book smart or street smart yep. is never t this right. together. But you try to train your kids that, you know what, it's good to be book smart, but you need to have some street knowledge. Mm -hmm. So people not pulling a wool mm -hmm. over your eyes. You know what I mean? But it's rare to find both in one person. It is. It is. But these days is a lot of people that think that they are, they have both, but unfortunate sometimes and um, our black people now are so powerful when they come to making money it's insane it's very much insane and it's taught and we talk down on it in yeah. in, 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 in our circle right. but we shouldn't and I see it I know it because I understand where we were and where mm -hmm. we're at now so I get it um, I got one question go it ahead. just came to my mind <laughs> so when we come to the restaurant and if I say I want to try one of your new dishes that you haven't put on the menu yet. Is that something that I can get? I absolutely do it. Even if I go back there and I make up something in, but I hadn't put um, fried. Or something new fried, that you're just making out of your head. Yeah, some, if I hadn't did fried uh, um, salmon bites yet, but I already got it all 
ready to go. But it's one thing that's in my head that I hadn't did yet. And you know, in in Texas, Tex Mex omelets is known. Meat mm-hmm. lovers omelets is known. Mm-hmm. But they don't they don't have. I just kind of came up with this. They don't have a Caribbean or island omelet. So I called. Uh, what would be an island omelet when you say island? Well, omelet. they got. You know, the Tex Mex is made out of pico. Mm-hmm. Pico, I can't ever say that. So I just say pico. pico. Yeah, mm-hmm. that word. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I called and I said, Do y'all have some kind of fruity, fruity pico? And they said, Matter of fact, we just got a brand new one. It's made of pineapple, uh, apple, mangoes. Mangoes. And, and I said, okay. Hmm, send that to me. So he sent me a sample and I tasted it. Oh, it was amazing. So I took it, got to scramble some eggs and, and ate it out of eggs. Good. It's good. So now I'm gonna make a. What well, is either gonna be called Caribbean omelet or the island omelet? But I'm okay. gonna make an omelet out of it. It's and dope. Do you have healthy food on your menu? Uh, we have uh, we have veggie omelet. We have uh, veggie fried rice. Uh, <laughs> that's like probably, uh, turkey stuff. No yeah, turkey we have, stuff. Yeah, we have chicken. We have chicken um, patty. We have turkey patty. We have uh, pork. So we have all. The, and you I just grilled. Add, yeah, we have grilled too. Okay. Grill, grill salmon, grilled catfish, grilled shrimp. You can have either way. You can have okay, both good, ways. Good. Have you ever had fried salmon? No. You do yeah. fried salmon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. I tell you what, man. We definitely appreciate you for coming on the show, man. You're always welcome to come back oh, here. Yeah. You're our brother. We love you, and we definitely thank you. And and what? Am I missing anything? Top three artists of all time, dead or alive. I your was top let three. My top three. Bed. Yes, he was. He was manager. He was around music. Man, I'm so. gonna tell you my top three that I love. Easy, easy. Ice Come on. Cube. Ice That's Cube. Number one. Number one. Number Jay Z. Number two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look, you waiting for that the third one? That was a Jay Z before. No, uh, number two. Man, he did Jay Z number two. Ice Cube and Jay Z is my top two. So number let three? me see what my three, one, third one would be. You know, you know, I'm telling my age, but you know, I really, uh, I really like Nipsey. Yeah, you know, that's but, dope. Okay. But Jay Z and them, I really that's like dope. Nipsey. That's those three. Ice Cube, Jay Z, and Nipsey. That's a Nipsey. good number three. Yeah. So thank okay. you for coming on the show, man. man. Appreciate y'all having me. Say, man, it's been another great segment of Boss Talk One Hundred and One. And we out.